to talk about this brain gain by first telling you a gain story. This lady you can see on the screen, she's in her mid-30s. In August of last year, she developed a sudden sort of headache on the left side, bang, and a few days down the line, she developed what we call ptosis, meaning she couldn't open her left eye. You can all see the picture. But also, she had a frozen eye as well. She couldn't move that eye. She went to, she actually, uh, she's actually based in Lagos. So she went to hospitals there, and guess what the diagnosis was? What was the diagnosis? Malaria and typhoid. Oh, my God. <laughs> Malaria and typhoid. Now, this is a CT angiogram. It's a brain scan looking at the blood vessels in the brain. Can anybody see what the problem is there? Where the arrow was pointing to? Now, this lady had an aneurysm. An aneurysm is a weak spot on the blood vessel. The predisposing factors are smoking and high blood pressure, the key, two key ones. Now, an aneurysm can rupture. And when it ruptures, in about 30% of patients, they don't even make it to hospital. Now, all you sitting here, do you know if you have an aneurysm? Actually, nobody knows. So you can imagine... In a country like ours, with a very poor healthcare system, if you're the president, the Senate president, an Okada driver, a businessman, and you have a ruptured aneurysm, and you don't have capacity to actually look after that patient, what happens to you? You die. So basically, this lady came to me, and then we operated on her. We had to remove, take out... The, this aneurysm from the circulation to prevent it from bleeding. Now, that's the aneurysm being clipped. That's the first clip being applied to the aneurysm. This is proper complex neurosurgery. Keyword, complex. And then the, the first clip, we're not very happy with because it's taking out some of the perforators. And then we take out that clip and put on that one. And then you can see the aneurysm like a ball just behind there. And then we have to decompress the aneurysm, puncture it. And then after that, we now use a cautery and actually bipolar the aneurysm to shrink it down. Now, remember the way the lady looked the last time? And then this was her about eight months later. Remember the first? Now, loss plus return equals gain. Now, with a show of hands, can anybody tell me if they really, really believe that this kind of complex neurosurgery could happen in Nigeria? Seriously, just tell me if you really believe that. Did anybody believe this? Okay. I wonder what percentage of the people in, the, in this. This is actually happening. Real complex neurosurgery is happening in Nigeria. Now, the truth is that we are on a journey. We are definitely nowhere near where we should be. But we are on a journey. We've started... And inshallah, we will get there. And amen to that. The gains. This is Mr. Nicholas Odinwe. He's the chairman of the Zitabel Group. This gentleman had a spinal problem. Remember, I said he's oil and gas, so he has. So he went to Dubai, went to London, went to America, had consultations. But this is spinal problem. And then he heard of Biodo Ogumbo, my big brother, also trained in the UK as well, a neurosurgeon, now based in Nigeria here. And then he was like, oh, I need to support my people back home. If this gentleman has come back from the UK and the, I gather he's providing such service, let me lock horns with him. And then he came back to Nigeria and in Garki Hospital here, he had his spinal operation. So he was like a guinea pig, isn't it? 
And he vowed that, hey, if, I'm, if I get through this alive, I will put money in healthcare and invest in healthcare. And he got through it. And what did he do? He put his money where his mouth is. And he, now that's where we have this is the Medicals and Diagnostics Limited. A round of applause for this gentleman. Because he put his money where his mouth is. Now, for a very long time, from, he, he had his operation roughly sometime in about 2013 or so. For a very long time, he put that, um, the, those facilities, because there's one in Abuja here, one in Portacot, and one in Uyo as well. He put those facilities down. But nothing much was happening until a guy called Douglas Emeka, of course, stepped into the fray. And then when he heard me speak for the first time, he was like, yes, let's go. And after that, operating microscopes, C-arms, everything started coming on board. Now, why am I talking about this? Sometimes you need human beings that have the stamina, have the grit, have the passion to be able to make things happen. That's what we need. So, three boza for Nicholas Odinui. Now, how do we sustain these gains? Now, one of the ways we can sustain these gains is cultural integration. One of my colleagues one of them was complaining about, oh, in Nigeria, they want, somebody wants to refer a patient to you, they want their own commission. And my response to that is, hey, if they want their commission and that makes patients better, why not? Why not? Why not? Oh, it's corruption. Is it helping the patients? Are we being, being culturally responsive? Then let's refer our commission. Let's make it, let's make it official or something. One of the reasons why most of the healthcare professionals here refer to India is because of Egunje. Our religiosity, we love God, isn't it? Both on the Muslim and Christian side. We can leverage on that. How come in our churches where people love their pastors and in our mosques people love their imams, how come we're not using those platforms to engage and empower Nigerians with information? One of the key issues, the key things I've had in Nigeria, I was, I was discussing with um, a colleague, two colleagues, and we were talking about looking after a patient who had brain cancer or a brain tumor. And then one of my colleagues said, oh, yes, uh, we should operate. And I asked him, have you ever had a, a brain operation? My wife has had a brain operation. I know what it means for the family and a patient who actually goes through a brain operation. And I asked him, I said, oh, what are the issues, uh, this operation we are going to do for this patient? What, what is the outcome? What is the benefit of doing such an operation? Are we going to look at the key issues of quality of life for the patient, of issues of patient dignity? And they're like, ah, this, all those who are now, uh, what do you do for that side when you come for here from Nigeria? We must be seen doing something. And I said, no. The people in UK, the human beings, they are the same thing with Nigeria. We must treat everybody with dignity. And there must be a reason why you want to operate on a patient. Because the Nigerian patients are worth it. Now, communication is up there. We've talked about the issues of, oh, oh you, you, you cannot advertise and stuff. Doctors for change. The first time I put a video there about some of the capacities that we have, people were like, oh, you're, you're advertising. And in my mind, I'm like, hey, when your mother or father's aneurysm rupture, you need to know where people like us are. You need to. Part 3, Section 23 and 24, especially 24, of the National, the National Health Act, a standing law in Nigeria, states that we have to disseminate and display information at Federal Ministry of Health level, State Ministry of Health level, local health authority level, uh, uh, local health authority level and the private uh, players as well. Let's provide information and let's be innovative and creative about it. Put information out there. Look at the hands, normal hands that went up. Nobody knows that this kind of thing is happening in Nigeria. A whooping 85% of Nigerians who go outside Nigeria for neurosurgical care do not need to go outside. Because that capacity rests within. The other issue was the issue of public-private partnership and how we can leverage and be on, on things like that and be innovative. And I mean in real terms, not just doing things on paper and not it translates to reality. So, for example, I'm private in Zeta the Medicals and Diagnostics, but within the last two months, I now provide service in Garaki Hospital as a visiting consultant. One of the last patients I operated on a complex brain tumor was looked after by Garaki, in Garaki Hospital, but they don't, have, they, don't, they don't have the capacity for such cases. So I did Garaki Hospital, Zeta Del Medical and Diagnostics, that has the powerful hardware to do such cases, and then back to Garaki Hospital. And that patient was saved about 1.5 million naira. That is real life 
innovation and try to push the boundaries of how you can actually deliver care in real time to Nigerians because they are what? Now, I don't know if any of you knows that guy there. Um, the truth is that you can actually have swag as a neurosurgeon. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, um, uh, um, uh, are you the, uh, you're the Nigerian Ben Kassin? I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not the Nigerian Ben Kassin. I'm the Nigerian Douglas Emeka Oko. <laughs> now, how's the journey been? Now, why did I decide to become a brain surgeon in the first instance? It was that there was value to be added. There was a massive gap. I trained in University of Benin. And from the mid-70s till 19 1998, when I was in my fourth year medical school, there was not one neurosurgeon in that hospital. So it was the gap that pushed me. And in my fourth, fifth year medical school, I decided I was going to be a brain surgeon. And guess what? I was always in parties. In fact, I used to do freestyle rapping when I was in my first and second year medical school. So when I told my friends I was going to be a, a neurosurgeon, what was their response? They laughed at me. And so, fast forward 2006, February, I landed in the UK to pursue my dreams to become a brain surgeon. And was it easy and straightforward? No, they dealt with me. How do you make steel from iron? You put it through fire, I went through fire. You know, my personality, I'm sure people like Chikwe and uh, Ikea, they see me dance in the TEDx you see in London. And then it's, it looks like I just went to the UK and I said, oh, this fine boy, fine toe, but oh, come and take the research. No, they put me through the meal. And guess what? I was trained properly. Um, her Excellency said something about one of the reasons why they were giving her all those jobs was she always told them that she was coming back. Before I left Nigeria, my plan was to come back to Nigeria. And one of my professors there, Professor Okonofa, who is big in, in the obst 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 obstetrics and gynecology um, um, area, asked me, uh, if you come back to Nigeria, where will you get equipment to work out? What did I tell him? When there's a wheel, there's a... The issues and challenges, you want me to bore you with that? We all know what the issues and challenges are. My coming back to Nigeria, I never ever thought for once that I was going to be. Collaborations and partnerships are very important, but in the real sense, greed. Greed. Did you know they let us see road? Greed. Greed. But thank God that the Nigerian patients are worth it. Now, the thing is, you want to come back into Nigeria, you will learn some things. First of all, like I said, you have to be an individual with grit and stamina. Since I came back to Nigeria, I know how broke I've been for a long time. But for me, I maintain the course. I keep the vision alive. Because the Nigerian patients are worth it. I don't want to bore you with the challenges. We all know what they are. But what I'm saying is that when you have more individuals that can connect with other people in such a way that they actually see the relevance. We talked about the relevance of actually putting their money where their mouth is. Like Mr. Nick Odinoe. That is where we need to go. And we need more genuine human beings. People are really surprised when they actually interface with me, patients and their families. There was a chap who came to see me from Lagos. They sent me some scans. And then I looked at the scans and said, oh, you have multiple lesions in your spine. And then my manager actually quoted some sort of figure estimate. Oh, this is probably what you will need to actually get looked after. This man flies all the way from Lagos, comes to see me, and I say, okay, we need to do two things. I need to look at the integrity of the bones of your spine, and we need to find out where this lesion or where this tumor, if it's a cancer, is coming from. And then by the time I looked at the scans of his bones, the integrity was really, really poor. And I told him, I said, hey, an operation will not be in your best interest. And they were surprised. Ah, with all these millions you quoted, you mean you're going to leave the money? Somebody once told me, somebody I respect someone, like, hey, you know, in Nigeria, you need to, you know, be a little bit diplomatic. You need to, the Nigerian way. And I'm like, no, I will maintain my integrity. I will maintain my genuineness, genuineness and I still will not eat grass. I will thrive and I will thrive very well.
Now, how do we move forward from here? How can we have this sort of capacities on ground in Nigeria with what the guys in Lagoon Specialists are doing, what the guys in First Cardiology are doing, what the guys in Cedar Crest here, here in Abuja are doing, what the guys in Brain and Spine Surgery Consortium are doing, what we in Citadel Medicals and Diagnostics are doing. Yes, there's the issue, the three A's, availability, accessibility, and affordability. In the short term, what the private sector blazers and trailers can do, they can provide you with availability. They will struggle with affordability, no doubt about it. But remember what I said initially, it's a journey. And we will get there. We will. We don't have a choice, actually. Let's keep pushing the boundaries, dear lovely ladies and gentlemen. And push the boundaries, we will. For one reason and one reason only. The Nigerian patients are worth it. God bless you all. Thank you.